Amazon wants to ship cheap stuff for free. Microsoft wants to sell you Wi-Fi. And EdTech's Cassandra tells us why virtual field trips are not the same as the real ones. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 350 for Tuesday, June 2nd, 2015. This episode of Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Dropbox for Business. Dropbox for Business lets your team sync and share files just like Dropbox. You and your employees already know how to use Dropbox. Don't waste your time trying to find a different solution. Visit dropbox.com slash twit for a free 14-day trial. That's dropbox.com slash twit. Welcome, I am Megan Maroney. Let's get to today's big news. Bloomberg reports that Amazon will now ship small goods to customers and waive the shipping fee even for non-Prime members. The program is called Fulfillment by Amazon Small and Light and is aimed at targeting the budget customer who likes tiny, cheap things. You know, people like me who like to shop at Target. Items eligible must be under eight ounces and cost less than $10. Microsoft is reportedly rebranding its Skype Wi-Fi service and working on a hassle-free internet service they're calling Microsoft Wi-Fi. This according to Windows Weekly host Mary J. Foley, writing in CNET. Skype Wi-Fi currently lets you use Skype credits to access mobile hotspots all over the world. In other Microsoft news, the company confirms rumors that they've purchased popular to-do app Wonderlist. I am a huge fan of Wonderlist. I use it on my laptop, my iPhone, even on my Apple Watch. I don't know if it makes me more productive, but it does somehow calm my anxiety to always have access to my never-ending to-do list, even if I'm not going to get to the end of it, probably ever. I'm not sure how I feel about this acquisition by Microsoft, but Wonderlist, CE, Wonderlist CEO Christian Reber says that they will continue to make their apps for iOS and Android. We'll have the rest of the tech headlines later in the show, but first I wanted to introduce Audrey Waters, creator of the site Hacked Education, author of The Monsters of Educational Technology, I first heard about Audrey from one of our viewers who wrote to me after a discussion we had on the show about for-profit online education. The email said that if you really want to talk to someone about ed tech, you have to talk to Audrey Waters. So welcome, Audrey. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So you write such great content about what's going on in this field right now. How did you get interested in this? Um, it's a long and convoluted story. I mean, I feel like in, in some ways I, I am sort of a child of sort of the personal computer in the classroom. Um, I was, had one of those early experiences with the Apple II computer and with the programming device called Logo, which was, a, which was a turtle that sat on the floor and we sort of learned a little bit about programming back in the... <clears throat> Um, several decades ago, I'll say. <laughs> and so I've always been interested in the ways in which um, technology may or may not change the way in which we teach and learn. Interesting. So let's talk one first about one of your recent pieces about the lessons we can learn from the learning channel, which of course most people now know as TLC and almost no one considers a channel where people learn things. Uh, I highly recommend that people read the whole piece, but I wanted to talk to you tonight about it because you say that what the history of the learning channel can help us understand now is some of the key issues in educational technology today. Uh, the first is uh, is the means by which the content is transmitted. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So, what this this history of the history of education technology is really interesting to me, and I feel like sometimes um, those of us who work in technology, we often um, assume that everything is sort of everything is sort of shiny and new, and it isn't until we just started to pay attention that things started to happen. Um, so, I'm really I'm always interested in the stories of what happened before, right? What happened before the Apple Watch? What happened before Microsoft? And in the you know, in the um, in the 1970s, NASA decided to allow its satellite to be used for sort of the public good, and it had an effort to sort of make educational television content um, available to broadcast it to to regions that had that didn't weren't able to have sort of in, um, educational institutions. And one of those was Appalachia. And they broadcast a lot of um, courses of that were used by teachers in the region to do continuing education. So if you think about it, it's sort of a, a proto MOOC, if you will, free on free um, broadcast educational content. Um, NASA's satellite went away. 
the the um, the the network turned to venture capital funding. They weren't able to make enough money. They the the um, the network um, their network owners went bankrupt, and eventually they were acquired by Discovery. Um, and Discovery sort of has sort of been a race to the bottom in sort of in terms of the quality of the content that's appeared on the channel. And I think it's worth so it's worth thinking about sort of. Who owns the content? We spend a lot of time talking, I think, about educational content, um, how that's delivered. We, um, in fact, that's sort of the metaphor that we use to talk about what you watch online, whether it's Khan Academy videos or YouTube videos. But we don't often think about who controls the who controls the network itself. And I think that that's something that educators, I would hope, start to pay a little bit more attention to. Of course, Discovery for some time was owned by um, by four cable slash um, television providers. And I think that thinking about what are the relationships between something like Comcast and NBC and the content they produce, what does that look like today when it when it appears um, when it appears on our laptop screens as opposed to our television screens? Right. Now what you're describing sounds a little bit about like Facebook's efforts, internet.org to get, uh, internet to places where they don't have it. I mean, it sounds all well and good. Yes, everyone should have the internet. Uh, but when it's, does it make you a little scared when it's controlled by Facebook? I think that it's it's something to think about the ways in which we see the sort of centralization of the control of, the, again, the control of the content, what, what appears, and then sort of the pipes the pipes and the networks themselves. We're very accustomed, I think, to sort of looking at television and recognizing the way in which Discovery, for example, owns many, many channels. And um, but we, when we look at the internet, we seem to still think of the internet as not being centralized and controlled that way. But increasingly, sites like Facebook, sites like Google, aren't just sort of aren't just the portal through which we access the internet, but they're actually sort of participating in in the network, in in sort of controlling the network itself, controlling access, what you see, what your internet experience looks like. And I think that's something that we should, you know, educators or not, um, we should all be paying more attention to. What about Khan Academy? Do you see them as the same controlling the content? Um, you know, interestingly, I think Khan Academy actually made a partnership with Comcast a couple of years ago um, to sort of make, to sort of deliver, um, to get sort of to make sure that people who had Comcast um, had special access to to um, to Khan Academy videos, and I think when we think about things like net neutrality, we we worry about who might have access to to again who might have access to high quality um, video content. The fact that folks are making special deals with the providers, I think, is something to be to be wary about. I think that Khan Academy Khan Academy is a really interesting example of sort of these new the new technology that we see on the internet. That when you stop and look at it, looks a lot like the old the old technology that used to be shipped out on video cassettes or that used to be shown in the classroom on on reel to reel film projector. What's new is if this, it's on YouTube, but really the the content itself doesn't actually actually seem that different to me. Right. So one of the other big issues you bring up with this article is what we mean by educational content. Who's deciding what educational content is and uh, why are they making these decisions? So so what did this uh, history teach you about that? Yeah, I mean, I think that it's it's this notion of edutainment has been around for a very long time. And it's this 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 dilemma, I think, that many of us um, who work in education feel is like, at what point do we start to make things flashy enough, right, exciting enough, with enough bells and whistles that students, um, perhaps board students in classrooms, pay attention? And then at what point do we cross the line and then that no longer becomes educational, it becomes purely entertainment? And I think that this is something that, this is a line that we've always had to sort of um, Debate. You know, at what point does does a Dis does a Disney movie in the classroom become a documentary, and at what point are we simply watching a cartoon? Um, and so, I think that you know this this idea of what counts as educational content and whose content whose content gets priority on our television screens, on our laptops. Um, you know, these are these are major these are major multinational corporations that tend to be the major players, despite all of the talk of you know, Silicon Valley disrupting education, even despite the talk of something like Khan Academy disrupting traditional education players, you know, Khan Academy announced today that they were partnering with the college board. I mean, these are, these are not small, these are not small, um, 
these are not small players in education technology. These are the these are the main drivers of our policy and practices. Right. Didn't they say they were going to offer SAT prep or something? SAT test prep. Yes. Yeah. Which is interesting because that that's often been the criticism. You know, the only people with money have access to SAT prep. Uh, so now, you know, everyone can have access to it. I mean, is that sort of the way they were selling this? I haven't read too much. I think so, it. yeah. I mean, this is this notion that one of the one of the things that the SATs have always been accused of is that there's a it, the, the correlation between how wealthy your parents are and how well you do on the SATs, right? So it seems as though the more money you have, the, the higher your score is. And so this is interesting. This will be really interesting to see what happens now that Khan Academy makes the SAT test prep free, freely available to ostensibly anyone or anyone with internet access, right? And so will it will the SAT still be something that is, so you can raise an eyebrow and say, is this actually an equitable or fair assessment of someone's aptitude? Um, or is this really just sort of demonstrating to me that their parents have enough, you know, their parents have, have money? So it'll be interesting to see what happens now that, now that um, the test prep will be free. Right. I mean, because free is one of those words uh, right now on the Internet that it can be really confusing because, oh, free is great. You know, Google Photos is free. It's great. Why doesn't everyone use it? But because, you know, when something is free, then we're the product. Right. I mean, so that that is the complicated thing. Yes, we want everyone to have all right. these things for free. But what are they taking? What information are they taking from us? Well, and I think that the interesting thing, too, about a lot of the test prep companies, right, the Kaplan's and Princeton reviews of the world is that they haven't taught they actually don't teach content. They teach the tricks in how you do well on the SAT, right? And so there are certain tricks that you look at when you look at a multiple choice test. There are certain things that you look for when you're doing the math section or the reading comprehension section. So is, is Khan Academy going to be in the business of teaching the tricks of how to do well on standardized tests? Or are they going to offer something that's actually of educational value? Because offering something of educational value isn't what the Kaplans have, have traditionally done. They just teach you the way in which to sort of move, quick, move quickly through the standardized testing. Right. So let's move on to another piece you wrote recently about virtual field trips last week at the Google I.O. Developers Conference, which you point out is also very much a marketing event. They announced a new version of Google Cardboard and Google Expeditions. It's the new way to use Google Cardboard to take virtual field trips. What are your thoughts on this? Um, I mean, I, for me, I want to just remind people that a virtual field trip is not is not a field trip. And field trips are actually incredibly important. There's not a ton of research out there, but the research that does exist suggests that field trips are really valuable, that even years later, um, decades later, people have really clear memories of what they did on field trips, where they went, what they saw, who, who they went with, who they sat next to on the bus, what the docent at the museum said. It's something that, for whatever reason, creates really really crystal clear memories in students. Um, and so, and it actually as well, that these are really important opportunities for low income kids as well, who might not be exposed to sort of cultural, um, cultural excursions on their own. So I think that field trips, providing field trips through public school is really an important educational equity issue. Virtual field trips are not that right? There's not really, there's no research that says that you can sort of generate the same sorts of really powerful memories from um, holding the Google, from holding, from experiencing a virtual field trip. I mean, and in some ways, really a virtual field trip is, is a movie. Uh, these are, you know, these are, these are, these are movies, as Google says, this will actually be available for people to watch without the cardboard device. And so, I mean, do we want to say that watching a movie in the class is the same as going out into the world? I don't think so. I think that going out into the world, having practical experiences, visiting historical sites, visiting sites of local consequence is really important. And it's important for all students. And it would really be a shame that school budgets increasingly cut act, you know, cut funding for, for field trips. It would be a shame to say, oh, well, the students get to sort of have the cardboard face where now let's not worry about budgeting money for them to go see the orchestra this year. Right. I mean, you make an excellent point that, you know, people are saying, well, now low income schools can, can go on field trips. But the real <laughs> question is, why aren't those low income schools able to go on field trips? I mean, public, why aren't public schools equitable? <laughs> 
Right. And I think that this is one of the things I worry about with education technology in general is that the kinds of opportunities that certain kids get with tech are amazing. But I think that certain kids, low income kids, um, kids in minority schools, for example, minority dominated schools, those tend to be less, less, um, less student centered experiences that they are doing. They're using technology for drill and kill. They are not using technology for creative self-expression. They are not having sort of maker inquiry driven project based learning experiences. Again, there's the kinds of there's the kinds of classes and many of us had them ourselves where the teacher would put a movie on and that was the educational experience. Um, computers are actually facilitating more and more of that. And I worry that w when we sort of say, yay, oh, my God, these kids got to go see sharks that um, that we're forgetting that. It's really important to make sure that everyone has hands-on learning experiences that are meaningful and relevant. And that does include going out into the world and not just having the face thing on. <laughs> right. I mean, I think there's room for both. I mean, I brought Google totally. Cardboard home to my 10-year-old twins this weekend. I mean, they loved it. They were like, I'm in Paris. I'm in Tokyo, just looking around. Uh, and we're probably not going to get to Paris or Tokyo in the next, you know, couple of days, maybe the next few months. So you know, I think there is room for both. But at the same time, it was a little bit frightening to see how suddenly absorbed they were in it. They didn't want to do anything else except for <laughs> have the cardboard on their face. <laughs> Well, and I think that, you know, this is this is the fascinating thing about about these new technologies, too, is I think that, you know, they are they are exciting and a lot of them are really um, they're they're shiny and cool. I mean, I, I'm a, like even as someone who's a critic of technology, I mean, I'm on my computer almost every hour of every day. I mean, I, you know, I, I sleep next to my iPhone just like most teenagers do. Um, but I think that we have to sort of ask, ask good questions about why, why we're using these. Um, what do they, what sort of, um, are these making the, making institutions more inequitable or are they sort of in, are decreasing some of the existing gaps that we already have in education? Right. So I want to move on. Last night on the show, I interviewed Ashley Vance. He's the biographer of the recent Elon Musk book. And now Musk is endlessly fascinating to me. And I wasn't really surprised last week when I heard that he, when he didn't like the school where his kids went, he just decided to start his own. Uh, the school sounded very interesting to me. I saw you had a tweet about it. It sounds like you have some uh, ideas about schools that are designed for the kids of tech companies. Um, is there something wrong with these kinds of schools? I mean, it seems to me a very similar motivation that led Max Ventilla, formerly of Aardvark and Google, to found Alt School as well, right? Mm -hmm. So this notion that looking around the opportunities for one's own children, not in not liking the public school, um, the public school environment, um, deciding that as as one does when one's a, an entrepreneur, that one can do it better if you just if you just engineered it yourself. Um, I under, I think that that's a that's to me a pretty understandable motivation as a parent myself. I completely understand um, being um, frustrated. I, but I also just, again, I, I worry that those who have the means to create their own school um, it is again, is this, an, is, this, is this an equity issue? And what are we doing to make sure that everyone has access to amazing, um, innovative opportunities? That this isn't just something for those who can afford the tuition at alt school. This isn't just something for those who are the sons and daughters of the engineers that work, um, work for Musk. Um, how do we make sure that everybody um, particularly the least fortunate among us, have an opportunity to go to a really cool school where people care about you and you have opportunities to do different and amazing things. Again, not sit in rows and watch, um, you know, Disney animated cartoons all day, right? So, I mean, I just think that, like, this notion of, um, this notion of founding a private school is understandable. But again, how do we make sure that this is, that we have a responsibility to the collective? We don't just have a responsibility to our children or our employees. Education, public education is really a, it's a public good. It's, it's something about the collective good. And to sort of continue to sort of squirrel away resources just to, just to um, enhance the outcomes of the privileged few to me is really a, a, a something I'm quite concerned with when I see um, those in technology deciding to do that. Well, isn't the idea behind alt school, aren't they raising money so that anyone can go to the school? It's not just for people who can afford the tuition? 
Um, I think that they do have some scholarships. I think that they plan to expand to other regions as well. But the, I mean, it's a pretty, it's a hefty, it's a, it's a hefty tuition. I think that the, that the, the proposed tuition for the school they're opening in Brooklyn is $28,000 a year. And so, I mean, I think that that's, you know, even if, even if they decide to offer, offer, um, scholarships to half half the students there's st- like more than half the students and you know at, at u.s public schools are free and reduced income students so i mean when when again when we when we put resources into private endeavors rather than feeding back into something for the public good you know i mean i think we have to ask what sort of what sort of outcomes who are we benefiting here um tech investors maybe but the rest of the public, I'm not so sure. Right. And you'd have to, I mean, live near Brooklyn or live near San Francisco, um, right. which has its own financial constraints for people. Yes, indeed. <laughs> so finally, let's talk about a piece you sent me about how schools are using tools to monitor their students on social media. Uh, what do you think is, uh, do you support this or what do you think about that? No, I think that this, I mean, I think that this is actually something that's, I mean, I find it, I find it really sort of, ironic, right? So schools, if you visit most schools, most high schools in the country, do not let their students have access to Facebook, Twitter, even blogs over the school Wi-Fi. Um, Particularly a site like mine, Hack Education, tends to be blocked because it has that word hack in it. And, you know, students who are visiting it might be up to some nefarious purposes. So, So on one hand, schools don't let students access this information. They don't let sort of teachers talk to students about what does it mean to sort of be online, have a digital identity. And yet more and more schools are opting to, to hire services that monitor their students outside of the classroom when they're on social media on their own time at home. And I think that that's, I think that this is sort of really, really troubling. Um, you know, do students have a right to free speech? Do students have a right to sort of say, even say like my teach, like my teacher, my eighth grade biology teacher is a total jerk and like, I think students have a, fr- a right to be able to say that. <laughs> and so to be able to, to, to sort of crack down, monitor, and punish students, I think is really troubling. And again, if we look at who gets punished in schools, overwhelmingly, these are minority kids, right? Overwhelmingly, schools act and punish minority kids at a much higher rate. So if we're going to sort of surveil public, if we're going to sur- surveil social media, again, we have to recognize that this is an equity issue. And the kids who are on Facebook and Twitter are sort of a different set of kids. If you look at sort of demographics of who uses Facebook and Twitter, that's a really different demographic than kids who are on Instagram and Snapchat. And so I think that um, schools deciding to monitor and and um, monitor their students and monitor their staff is definitely a free speech, definitely a free speech speech issue. Right. And they say what everyone says in this, it's it's for the kids, it's for their safety. We right. can monitor safety. if someone is suicidal. You know, that's the arguments they'll use. Someone's been, you know, posting, I'm, I'm depressed. Uh, so, you know, that's why we're doing it. But you, you don't think that um, that's really, I mean, that, that's while that's true, there's also other issues. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I think while that is true, and I think that certainly, you know, I think this is something that even individual teachers fret about a lot when a student of theirs friends them on Facebook. You know, teachers teachers debate, like, should I friend my students? And I'm not talking, I mean, uh, you know, someone who's in your classroom is a 15-year-old, are they your friend on Facebook? And what sort of relationships do teachers um have with their students online. I think that parents probably have the same question too. Like, do you friend your 14-year-old son's friends on Facebook? I don't know. Like, there's a certain, like, creepy treehouse factor there of when you're the grown-up monitoring, even, you know, even out of really, you know, really good intentions, being the person online who sees something that you don't want to see um, and deciding what what your obligations are, I think that schools, because of schools, um, schools aren't just there to sort of um, to care about the well being of their students. Schools often serve as a sort of punitive um, force in students' lives as well. And I think it's really unfortunate if schools aren't going to sort of help students understand what does it mean? What does it mean to have all of these technologies, to have our data strewn everywhere, sort of um, a- around the internet. They're going to sort of ban ban technology in the classroom, ban social media use in the in school, and then also 
sort of um, monitor students at home. I, I feel like it's less about this, the suicide pre uh, prevention. It's less about looking out for cyberbullying. And to me, it seems um, it seems like a much more insidious way into sort of sort of creeping into students students' personal private lives. That really, I'm not sure that schools have responsibility t to do so. Right, and I mean they're paying these organizations a lot of money right. to do it. It's hard. I mean, there's a lot of data out there, and so you know, and I don't know if the parents are getting to vet these organizations at all, or even know that it's going on. I think that most parents don't even know what's going on. There was an incident earlier um, earlier this year where Pearson, um, who, the major textbook testing company, um, sort of it was revealed that they were monitoring social media to see if students were ostensibly cheating on the standard on their Common Core standardized tests. And I think parents were really shocked to learn that that their students, that students um, were being monitored by this major, major company. And on one hand, you know, you can always say, well, they're, 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 you know, they're pulling in massive amounts of data. Like how, like how, how, how finely, you know, grained is the sort of monitoring that they do? And are they just looking for keywords? Are they looking for keywords associated with depression or bullying or cheating? Or are they, or are they really sort of creating this other sort of data profile? And again, if we don't know, we just have to sort of trust that these, you know, trust that these organizations are sort of um, working in our in our children's best interests. I think that, you know, I think that this, these issues around data and privacy and children and students are really one of the most contentious issues in education technology right now, partially because there's just very little transparency about what's going on. Yeah, and as you say, I mean, suspensions are just rife with bias, um, you know, by, by bias we don't, that teachers and educators don't even understand. So, I mean, there's so much on social media that can be misunderstood or misinterpreted. I mean, you know, everybody knows that. So, you know, that that's what can be frightening, I think, if they're monitoring all of that. Yeah, I think so too. So Audrey, thank you so much. Audrey Waters is the author of The Monsters of Educational Technology, which is a collection of her essays. She's on Twitter at Hacked Education. Is there anything else you're working on that you can tell us about? I'm also working on a book right now on the history of education technology called Teaching Machines. Well, thank you, Audrey. I uh, hope you'll come back again and talk to us next time. Thank you. One of these stories has blown up to some sort of privacy concern, then we can talk about it again. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Take care. Bye. Coming up, now you can buy stuff on Pinterest, and Google's working on an app that can count calories from photographs. But first, many of you use Dropbox. We do too. And at Twit, we use it to sync and share files, everything from photos to audio MP3s, large graphic files, invoices, program schedules, all of it. People in over 4 million businesses throughout the world use Dropbox, and you can dr grow your business with Dropbox for Business. It's the better way to manage accounts, manage billing, have visibility and control over your data. Dropbox for Business lets you do just that, and you don't have to waste time finding another solution. Dropbox for Business is the same easy Dropbox experience your employees already love and trust. That means less training and more productivity, simple storage and sharing for any type of file on any platform on any device. Dropbox for Business never runs out of space. Each user starts off with a terabyte and it's very easy to expand. Staff can collaborate with team members and securely invite and control access to outside partners, clients, and vendors. And most importantly, for you IT professionals, you have control. Dropbox for Business has powerful admin controls like remote wipe, intuitive sharing and permission controls, plus complete audit logs. This way, IT can make sure only the right people get access to the sensitive company data. Dropbox for Business integrates with third-party security and administration solutions such as SIM, DLP, and eDiscovery for even more control. And last but not least, the robust Dropbox for Business infrastructure uses encryption for file data in transit and at rest, plus segmentation and hashing to anonymize files. Extra security features are available like single sign-on and two-step verification. If you want to give it a try, sign up for Dropbox for Business at dropbox.com slash twit for a free 14-day trial of Dropbox for Business. That's dropbox.com slash twit. Now on to a few more stories we're following today. Today in Apple News, the next web reports that Apple's Internet of Things has arrived. The first HomeKit products are available now and include lighting kits, hubs, thermostats, and more. In your house, the devices can be controlled by Siri. You'll need an Apple TV if you want to control them when you're away. I'm sure we'll be hearing a lot more about HomeKit next week at Apple's Worldwide Developers Conference that we'll be covering here from the Twit Studios. 
Wired says that Pinterest will now expand from the place where we look and covet other people's lifestyles to a marketplace where we can actually buy things. At an event in San Francisco today, Pinterest showed off their new blue buy buttons that show a price and let you pay for some items with a credit card or Apple Pay. So get ready to turn that envy into something real. And just in case you were curious, all those pictures on Pinterest of Ryan Gosling do not have a buy button. I know because I checked for you, not for me. This Monday, this morning on Tech News Today, Mike Elgin reported that SoundHound, the company behind the new voice search app, simply called Hound, they, uh, you can listen to his full report at twit.tv slash TNT. The CliffsNotes version is the product launched today in private beta. It enables navigation, search, weather, news, and more delivered through a Siri-like voice interaction. The company is also launching a platform called Houndify that enables developers to add a voice interface to any app. And finally, this week in popular science, there's the report that the artificial intelligence of my dreams is on its way. If you use health apps to keep track of the calories you consume in a day, you know that there's a lot of guesswork involved. Sure, many apps will let you take photos of barcodes, but that just works for packaged processed food. That's not that great for you anyway. Popular Science says that this at this week's Rework Deep Learning Summit in Boston, Google research scientist Kevin Murphy revealed sophisticated deep learning algorithms that have the ability to estimate the calories of a plate of food simply by analyzing a photo of that food. The project is called I'm Two Calories with the number two, and Google did not share details about when it would be available. And I realize that counting calories is not the perfect path to good health, but recording the food you've eaten and understanding more about it can be helpful. What do you think? Do you want this kind of technology? Email me at megan at twit.tv. We will read your thoughts on the show. Thanks to Steve T, Dana, and Fabe for the email compliments on the show. You can also send your thoughts to me via Twitter. I am at Megan Maroney. And that is it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. Subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. You can subscribe through iTunes or Feedly or Stitcher or Spotify, many other places. You find them all at twit.tv. And you can watch us live, of course, right here every weekday at 4 p.m. Pacific. That's live.twit.tv. Don't miss our morning news program, Tech News Today, every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I am Megan Maroney. Thank you for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Cashfly.com.